I must begin by thanking all those involved in organizing this conference. Um, and I owe a special uh, thanks to Sabine Cadeau, who extended a gracious invitation to me to address you and then waited patiently until I, while I engage my inner Hamlet and in trying to decide to do or not to do. Although I'm a historian with a long-standing interest in comparative approaches to the study of peoples of African descent in the Americas and elsewhere, obviously that characterization describes many of the speakers who will address you uh, over the coming days. Um, any one of whom might equally, if not, be better suited to this task. Indeed, the conference program reveals the broad scope of the topics. Over time and in diverse spaces, that the reparations issue has come to embrace. The recent publications, moreover, have underscored that the demands for reparations for slavery and the slave trade have a long history. Uh, at the very least stretching back to the early 19th century, albeit limited success, with limited success. Uh, and I'm thinking uh, in particular of Anna Arojo's recent uh, transnational and comparative study of this topic. Thus, one might regard um, a conference such as this uh, coming 134 years uh, after the last slave regime in the Americas was abolished as an opportunity to assess just where we are and where we might go, uh, to reflect on what the increasingly diverse and re-energized campaign might yet achieve. Ironically, framing the task in these terms resolve my ambivalence um, about whether I was an appropriate choice to deliver this uh, opening keynote address. Upon reflection, I concluded that the task of envisioning reparations, as the title of this conference describes our agenda, is necessarily political as well as historical. And as such, it necessarily suggests the question What's at stake? Or to break that down a bit more, one might ask, what is envisioned as a goal or outcome that is the nature of the repair we are seeking? And this raises in turn the question, what might be envisioned as a process for achieving that goal? We are revisiting an argument and campaign that is now at least two centuries old, a conference such as this seems an appropriate opportunity to think critically about goals and means. Historical knowledge of the of Atlantic world slavery and its aftermath is well represented at this conference. But as I reflect on how I might best contribute to that task, I concluded that my own life experience might be a place to start. Uh, not God forbid that my life is so exceptional, but rather the opposite. That in some ways it captures at least some of the common themes we might want to consider, as well as something with a broad chronological frame within which we need to work. I was born during World War II in Southside Virginia, an area historically shaped by tobacco farming and later the milling of diverse fabrics from cotton fibers transported from states further south. Both sides of my family, paternal and maternal, were enmeshed in one or the other of these economies for as long as anyone could remember. Like many other black southerners, they would not escape its clutches before the period between the two wars, the two world wars, when social and technological forces began to erode the post-emancipation economy's grip on Black people's life chances. My father was born in the First World War and thus was of age to be drafted into the second. He would return home to a rapidly changing economy 
that enabled his, his escape from the farm and the mill. My father's life course was not entirely exceptional, of course. As I will have argued elsewhere, the broad social and economic changes he and his seven brothers experienced transformed the conditions of possibility for many Black Southerners, and as a result, enabled the broad social movement challenging racial injustices that his son's generation would be drawn into roughly two decades later. Nonetheless, broadening the chronological frame to embrace previous generations of the family reveal other factors that have positioned him to benefit from a cha changed opportunity structure that would elude many of his peers. I will recount a bit of this family history in an effort to open and partly explore the question puts, questions put earlier. What's at stake in the effort to repair the damage of past racial injustices? And what is the process by which they might be achieved? For a future historian, it's embarrassing to admit, I grew up fairly ignorant of the history of my place and my people. Attending segregated schools was not very helpful in remedying the, my deficient historical understanding. Thus, it was only after earning a PhD and beginning my teaching career that I set out to recover my own family's history. Unfortunately, it was a case of being a day late and a dollar short, uh, as they say, since by that time, the, idea, the time the idea occurred to me, uh, many of the family elders who might have been helpful had passed on, except for my paternal grandmother's sister, Aunt Carrie, as everyone calls her, who introduced me to Jenny, a slave woman born before the Civil War and the oldest known matriarch of the family line on my father's side. Now, I will spare you an account of the splendid detective work that ensued. Suffice it to say that I discovered, as was all too common on slave farms and plantations throughout the Americas, that Jenny's mother had given birth to children fathered by her owner. Somewhat less common, however, Jenny herself would inherit land from her father and managed somehow to pass it down to subsequent generations, including my father's mother. Unfortunately, I was not able to discover what motivated this act of law jest by the white father. I learned that he was an officer in the Confederate Army and a casualty of the Civil War, which meant someone else in the family, the white family, ensured that this financial legacy was respected and not challenged by other family members. The point of my story, nonetheless, is that this legacy was life-changing for generations of the Black family members, including me, eventually. Of course, one should be careful not to overestimate the relative independence and security that land ownership, even of small plots, could afford Black families in a racist society. Legal and economic chicanery and overt violence could turn Black landowners into paupers at any moment. But for those who escape that misfortune, land ownership could also provide opportunities that their less fortunate neighbors were deprived of. I witnessed this in a segregated and elementary school that I attended. Though not fully understanding it at the time, there I witnessed striking differences in the experiences of the children of sharecroppers and tenants and those as contrasted with those of either small landowners or those whose parents, like mine, were employed in non-farm occupations. The croppers' kids started their school year after the harvest and left at the beginning of spring planting. Thus, their school year ran roughly from late October until early April, at best. Obviously, one would have to be exceptionally talented to master a nine-month curriculum in just four or five. 
Moreover, given the annual turnover in sharecropping contracts, many of my classmates moved through many different schools during their school going years, and sometimes within, even within the same year. By contrast, the relative security and stability of my family's situation meant that Jenny's descendants would have life opportunities, notwithstanding the deficiencies of a segregated system that might enable escape from the difficulties that such educational deprivation would have inevitably produced. Hopefully that little family history makes, helps make vivid the stakes of repairing the damage that unfolded in the aftermath of slavery's abolition. The fate of Jenny's progeny illustrates what might have been had the brief prospect of land reform, 40 acres and a mule, that followed slavery's abolition. Instead, the vast majority of emancipated slaves found themselves subject to new forms of domination that not only impoverished them, but passed that condition down to subsequent generations. Thus, not only legal slavery, but the terms of its abolition blasted the hopes and crippled the futures of generations hence. Obviously, the racial injustices typically referenced by arguments for reparations are in fact historic. But ironically, that very language has the effect of displacing it into a time beyond memory. And the effect of that displacement can undercut the broad public support necessary to its political success. One can easily imagine, or indeed have heard, how the opposition's argument might go. Slavery was centuries ago, they will argue. My family came to this country long after those days had passed, seeking equal opportunities. Ergo, I should not be held responsible for or taxed to remedy such ancient crimes. Indeed, a version of this argument underpins the, a, a case challenging affirmative action in college admissions being argued before the US Supreme Court at this very moment. In this case, the plaintiffs are largely of Asian American uh, descent, and thus many are children of mid 20th century immigrants. Thus, a counter argument dependent on the original sin of slavery is not likely to offer an effective rejoinder. It is possible, however, that one documenting the pernicious offspring of that original sin, that is, how the initial injustice continues to produce and reproduce new injustices decades and centuries later, might have a better chance. For example, I mentioned earlier that my father returned home from the Second World War and was soon able to leave farm work on the cotton mill behind. He was able to do so because the GI Bill's benefits paid for his training as a barber, which enabled him eventually to run an independent business. Much like the family's post-emancipation property legacy, therefore, this mid 20th century veterans benefit was a stroke of luck. But again, many other black veterans were denied the government benefits to which they were entitled. I will forego the details of how the system worked to discriminate against black applicants, but suffice it to say that the power relations shaping the administration of public benefits in the South was a feature of a larger historical failure to reconstruct the former slaveholding republic. To put it briefly, the local federal agents administering these programs blatantly discriminated against Black veterans. They were in a position to do so, however, because Southern political power relations were shaped by a history of Black voter suppression and racial terror, all of which dates back to the failed reconstruction of the slaveholders' republic. It can easily be demonstrated moreover that while Southerners did the act, national powers enabled them. Examples I have discussed thus far suggest that the American nation state should be one of, if not the, 
principal address C for demands to address the multiple economic injuries that people of African descent have suffered in America. This is not to exclude the claims for redress made, made many successfully, to private entity, entities like universities and businesses. It is simply to recognize that the scope of these initiatives is by definition more limited and often involve moral and symbolic rather than uh, material compensation for past actions. Nation states, by contrast, have by commission or omission shaped the material life chances of their citizenry. Historians can show how government policies and actions, beginning with the slave trade and slavery and continuing to the present day, have deprived the descendants of former slaves of access to land, to employment, to decent housing, and other government benefits. In short, the case for reparations begins but does not end with slavery. My point in recounting my own family's history then is to suggest that the appropriate response to the question, what's at stake, is not simply to win compensation for the unpaid labor of an enslaved ancestor. Rather, it should be framed in terms of the consequences of a failure to redress the long chain of injustices that came after slavery's destruction. We historians know that there were real debates and failed initiatives to give all former slaves the stakes for a new life that Jenny's descendants enjoyed. One should, could easily demonstrate that such uh, initiatives could well have shaped their and the nation's future, much like the government measures to, for example, to enable home ownership created an expanded middle class in the mid 20th century. 40 acres and a mule in the 1860s could have plausibly fostered a more democratic, small d, Southern political order. One that ensured, for example, that black farm owners and domestic laborers had access to social security benefits, which they did not. Uh, and that black veterans received GI education and housing benefits, which often they would be uh, deprived of. In some, a racially democratic social political order that would have made affirmative action unnecessary. To the original sin of slavery then, one should add the failure to reconstruct a society built on slave labor, a failure that ultimately sustained and extended the injuries deep into the following century. In response to this argument, the defense that relegates such injuries to a distant past, is no longer relevant because those injuries continue well into the present. Its perpetrators are also of the present. Now I began this analysis by relating my family's uh, experience uh, in an effort to frame in concrete terms the nature of the injury that in my view we need to address. It is an injury rooted in the past but enduring in and shaping the present. Also implicit in that analysis is the question of who should be the addressee of reparations demands. Many of the current reparations campaigns have targeted private institutions like universities and businesses that in one way or another were founded on or have otherwise benefited from enslaved labor. Targeting such entities can be quite effective in many cases, given the relative clarity of the historical connections and the clearly demonstrable benefits that accumulate to those institutions over time. But the arguments addressed to private institutions founded on and or benefiting from enslaved labor are inherently different from those addressed to largely public institutions uh, whose policies and administrative procedures reproduced and extended the injuries of a racist regime. For example, the racial demonstration rife in the administration of veterans' benefits, housing mortgage policies, and public education, arguably built on and exacerbated the original injuries of slavery. But making such a case is likely to be much more difficult 
and overcoming resistance to it much more complicated. One will also confront the fact that how the various nation states involved in Atlantic world slavery are implicated and thus might be addressed is also more complicated. I address the question of what might be at stake in a campaign for reparations by focusing on my own family's history and thus necessarily on developments in the United States. But of course, the case for reparations is cross-national, involving every nation in the Americas and several in Europe. Although one should take care not to conflate their histories with respect to these, this question. There are some broad similarities as well as differences. First of all, and most strikingly, Haiti, Cuba, and the United States are the only countries where slavery ended as a result of, or in the course of, a vast instructive civil war. In the United States, the slaveholders' defeat in a long and bloody war mooted the question of their receiving monetary compensation for their lost property. Indeed, because of their disloyalty, many were at least partly, or at least briefly, divested of their landed property. Cuba's case was a bit more complicated because of the emancipation, the emancipation process they unfolded over several decades. Uh, and as recent stories in the New York Times, and I believe one of the papers for this conference, show, Haiti's story was more different still. Despite Haitian slave rebel military victory over the slaveholders, the new Haitian nation was eventually forced to pay compensation for the slaves it had liberated. Indeed, to my knowledge, this is the only time in history that the victor in a war ended up paying reparations. But although exceptional in that respect, such payments were otherwise consistent with the broader pattern of indemnification of Atlantic rural slaveholders uh, for the loss of their slave labor. Throughout the Americas, many, if not most, slave owners received some form of reimbursement for the slaves they set free, or they had been set free. In some cases, this took the form of continued labor service and or monetary payments, often both. It may be that in some cases, the alternative to making such ransom payments would have been war with slaveholders, but in most cases, such threats were not viable, really. Despite radical abolitionist arguments to the contrary, then, claims to property rights in human beings was well established. Moreover, it was not only slave owners who were invested in defending those rights, but a broad class of investors, as well as the state itself, oftentimes, who shared in the fruits of enslaved labor. Historians have long debated just how this formidable opposition was overcome. It's possible that that debate might offer clues of how we might approach the second question raised above. That is how one might win the debate about the efficacy as well as the justice of reparations for historic wrongs. Much of that debate has focused on the case of Great Britain, the first major power to initiate a general emancipation policy. With my tongue planted firmly in cheek, I might begin to explain the motivation behind Britain's initiative to abolish slavery in its West Indian possessions by quoting Colonial Secretary Edward Stanley, that it simply reflected what he called, quote, the liberal and humane spirit of the age, unquote. It was that moral conviction Stanley argued, that led Britain to sacrifice the financial interests of the West Indian planters and their capitalist investors to the greater popular abhorrence of slavery. Thus, as he put it, Britain would, quote, set the world the glorious example of a commercial nation weighing its material advantages light in the balance against justice and religion, unquote. A generation of British historians would buy Stanley's explanation, hook, line, and sinker. Eric Williams begged to differ. 
which set off a decade long, decades long debate over how one might explain such a radical change in thinking and state policy. The debate that ensued is arguably relevant to the question of how one might hope to win a similar debate over reparations. The gist of Williams rejoinder was that the so-called moral suasion argument was insufficient to overcome the entrenched powers who profited from enslaved labor. Contrary to later characterizations, he did not insist that moral values were completely irrelevant, but they were just not in themselves sufficient. I'm confident that this audience is well acquainted with the interventions that later historians have made in attempting to sort out the causal nexus here. Suffice it to say that the moral epiphany argument has been linked to broader social dynamics that render a far more complex explanation. The bottom line, I think, is that however compelling the moral suasion arguments might have been, people in power had to be convinced that it was in both the national as well as their own private material interests to embrace abolition. And even then, it required 20 million pounds sterling, uh, 20 million pounds sterling wide uh, in a transitional apprenticeship or in free labor to seal the deal. The question then is whether a similar strategy, a moral argument supplemented by an appeal to self-interest will be necessary to overcome the predictable opposition in our own time, the reparations for slavery and its aftermath. It is surely predictable that the forces and the interests that are likely to be arrayed against any serious material recompense for slavery as its enduring injuries and disabilities will be formidable. The fierce resistance to even a public acknowledgement of or memorialization of slavery's uh, atrocities, such as, for example, the recent backlash in the French parliament against recognizing the nation's complicity in the slave trade, suggests the difficulty such a campaign will confront. Thus, the decades-long abolition campaigns in the early 19th century suggest what a 21st century campaign is likely to confront, but also the multi-pronged strategy required for success. Certainly, moral suasion played an important role both in shaping the public conversation and shaping the political terrain. But the ultimate success also required, as the much maligned arguments of Eric Williams suggest, that powerful interest groups, economic and political, come to see their interests would be better served by transitioning from slavery to free labor. Just as then, documenting the harm of slavery is unlikely in itself to be enough to turn the tide. Could it be that an argument based on slavery's enduring consequences deep into the present may be more persuasive? Though not successful, only partially so, similar arguments have gained traction in the past. In 1965, President Lyndon Johnson's Howard University address arguing for affirmative action had a similar premise, notwithstanding the flawed historical logic of the speech, it's his speechwriter, Pat Monahan. In fact, its basic premise was consistent with earlier demands of civil rights activists who recognized that the mere, or rather that mere legal changes would be insufficient to reverse the damage that a century of racial oppression had brought. Drawing on, the post-war reconstruction of Europe, they framed their demands as a martial plan for Black America. But it was, in effect, a 20th century version of 40 acres in the new. To some extent, its logic would be reflected to some degree in the late 1960s Great Society programs, though ultimately underfunded and politically orphaned. Viewed retrospectively, I suspect many historians might be dubious about these associations, but the fact that so many social movement activists actually worked in these programs suggests something of the hopes they ever so briefly inspired. 
For many, these commitments seemed opportunities to achieve a more prosperous as well as a more just society for all. For a fleeting moment at least, that prospect gained a broad and diverse public support. Perhaps what we have learned both about the long reach of slavery's original sin down the years into our present and the repeated efforts of its injured progeny to be heard will ultimately prove useful in shaping a viable strategy to win the address of historic wrongs, now centuries old. With that hope, I return to the two questions I posed at the outset of this talk. What are the stakes? And what is the strategy? And thus, argument for achieving that. First, I've tried to suggest that the stakes and thus arguments for projects focused on various private entities, such as universities, financial institutions, and other businesses, while important, are likely to be different from the more broadly focused targets, which are more likely to be nation states or particular administrative entities within them. The private or quasi-public ent public entities are likely to be softer targets in that the history of exploitation is more demonstrable and the class of beneficiaries more limited. Um, for example, the direct descendants of the injured parties in those cases. Or alternatively, the form of the reparations might take the form of benefits to a restricted class, for example, university scholarships, or simply symbolic acknowledgments of historic wrongs. On the other hand, where nation states are targeted, the benefits are likely to be more material and substantial but also more difficult to achieve because the beneficiaries constitute a large target population. For instance, these might include programs targeting a broad class of people to provide education and housing subsidies, healthcare supports, banking and credit services, and so forth. One does not have to invent the wheel here. Such programs already exist in other nations as the normal benefits of citizenship. I will not attempt to presume to suggest all the possible forms such reparations might take to remedy the enduring historical effects of slavery. Suffice it to say that the chances of gaining sufficient political support for them is likely to be enhanced if they are not only benefits, if they not only benefit a given pop target population, but in the process offer the prospect of building a more just and prosperous society for all. This is hardly a new argument, of course, but perhaps in time, it will prove a winning one. Thank you.